I love games, and I especially love winning games. That's why my favorite game is rock, paper, scissors played against an actual pair of scissors. The mathematical study of strategy is called game theory. While you might think this is a field all about just having fun, it's actually connected to some of the deepest areas of mathematics. One of these connections is to the Banach-Tarski paradox. This is a paradox that says you can take a ball, cut it up into five pieces, move them around a bit, and then assemble them into two copies of the original ball. This is a paradox because rotations and translations preserve volume, so it seems like this should be impossible. However, there's a game that, if you can win, stops the paradox dead in its tracks and then actually proves it impossible. So do you want to play? It's going to take us a minute to get there, so let's start with a simpler game first. The game Chomp is played on a special chocolate bar where the bottom left square has been poisoned. A turn consists of picking a square and eating it and eating everything above and to the right of that square. The game continues until a player has eaten the poisoned square, and of course this means they lose. If you'd like, you can play Chomp online. Thomas Ferguson made a website where you can play against the computer, and I'll put a link to that in the description. Chomp is a surprisingly tricky game, especially against the computer. And if you keep playing, it might feel like victory is forever out of reach. But is it? The question is, if you got to pick who goes first, is there a strategy that will always guarantee your victory? Well, of course. Any finite two-person game that can't end in a draw has to have a winning strategy for one of the players. This result is known as Zermelo's theorem. But just because we know that a winning strategy exists doesn't mean that we know what it is. A lot like chess, chomp is so complicated that even for moderately sized boards, we still don't know the winning strategy. Despite this, we can prove that the first player, if they were clever enough, could always guarantee a win. The proof uses a clever argument known as strategy stealing. Let's suppose that player two actually had a winning strategy. This means that no matter what player one does, player two has a response that keeps them in a winning position. Now, as player one, let's make our first move be the top right square. And let's look at all of player two's possible responses to this. What you should notice is that all of the responses are themselves moves that could have been made on the first turn. So for any game state that player two hands back to player one, player one could have handed that game state to player two on their first turn. For example, if this is player two's optimal response, then player one could have just made that their first move instead. Since we assumed that player two could guarantee a win from this position, instead, player one could guarantee a win by stealing player two's strategy. What this tells us is that the best first move is to either pick the top right corner or to pick player two's best response to picking the top right corner. Unfortunately for player two, this means player one can always win. That being said, just because we know that player one has a winning strategy doesn't mean that we know what it is. And when I play against the computer, I almost always lose, even when I'm player one. This proof is a pretty slick argument, and it definitely took me a few minutes to understand. So feel free to meditate on it for a bit, or go back and rewatch until you understand. Now that we have the concept of strategy stealing under our belts, we can move on to the game in this video's title. This is called the Gale Stewart game, or what I'll call the Determinacy game. It's played by two players, Alice and Bob, who take turns painting the positive integers. Alice starts by picking a positive integer, say m, and coloring the first m positive integers red. Then Bob picks a positive integer, say n, and colors the next n positive integers blue. Then Alice picks another positive integer and colors that many red, and so on. They continue coloring the positive integers forever. After the game is over, they've split the positive integers into a red set and a blue set. Alice wins if the red set is good, and Bob wins if it's not, where what it means for a set to be good was determined before the game started. Just like how different sizes of the starting board change the strategy for Chomp, different choices of what makes a set good change the strategy of the determinacy game. For example, let's say a set is good if it contains infinitely many prime numbers, and let's watch our two masterminds play. Alice starts off the game wisely by coloring 1 and 2, securing the first prime number for the red set. Bob tries his best. He picks 1 trillion, because prime numbers get sparser as the numbers get bigger. But sadly for him, there's no hope. Alice just keeps on coloring until she hits a prime number. Since there are infinitely many prime numbers, Alice can always keep coloring until she hits a prime number. 
The strategy will guarantee that the red set will always have infinitely many prime numbers, and this means that Alice is guaranteed to win. For the next game, let's say that a set is good if it contains only finitely many powers of 2. Alice starts off the game by coloring 1. Yeah, it's a power of 2, but she's feeling pretty cocky. After all, she chooses what to color red. But Bob has a trick up his sleeve. He colors 2 and 3. See, this forces Alice to color 4 on her next turn. And in fact, no matter what Alice does, Bob can always force her to pick a power of 2 by coloring up to a power of 2 minus 1. So Bob can force the red set to have infinitely many powers of 2, securing his victory. In some sense, the deterministic game is a universal game, because you can encode any finite game as a deterministic game for the right choice of what makes a set good. We call a game where one player has a winning strategy determined, and you might recall that Zermelo's theorem says that every finite game is determined. But what about the deterministic game? Is it determined? That is, for any choice of what makes a set good, does Alice have a winning strategy, or if she doesn't, does Bob have a winning strategy? Well, maybe. The deterministic game isn't a finite game, so Zermelo's theorem doesn't apply. That being said, if you play this game for a bunch of choices of what makes a set good, it'll seem like you could always find a winning strategy for Alice or for Bob. If you want a challenge and you've taken calculus, try figuring out who wins the deterministic game under the following condition. A set is good if the sum of reciprocals in the set diverges. If you can figure it out, leave your answer in the comments. In 1975, Donald Martin proved a huge extension of Zermelo's theorem when he showed that all Borel conditions have a winning strategy for one of the players. What it means to be Borel is a bit technical, but pretty much any condition you'd ever think of is Borel. But are there any games where neither player has a winning strategy? It's hard to imagine. After all, at the end of the game, the red set is either going to be good or it isn't. So one of the players is going to win. The axiom of determinacy is the assumption that the determinacy game is always determined. Mathematicians have extensively studied this axiom and what conclusions you can draw from it. But our goal now is to build a determinacy game where neither player has a winning strategy, which might make it seem like these mathematicians have wasted their time. Let's start by saying that two sets are almost the same if they differ in only finitely many places. We could think of this as being able to turn one set into the other by making finitely many flips of whether an integer is in it or not. I'll denote two sets that are almost the same with this little squiggle, so you can read this expression as saying, A is almost the same as B. If two sets aren't almost the same, I'll call them essentially different. So for example, all finite sets are almost the same, because any two finite sets differ in only finitely many numbers. Similarly, the set of prime numbers and the set of odd prime numbers are almost the same, because their only difference is the number 2. On the other hand, the set of prime numbers and the set of composite numbers are essentially different, because to turn one into the other, you'd have to add and take away infinitely many numbers. This is actually a manifestation of a much more general fact. The complement of a set A, that is, all positive integers not in the set A, is essentially different from A. To test your understanding, see if you can explain why this is true. I'm going to start abbreviating almost the same as AS, because it's getting to be a bit of a mouthful. In the determinacy game that we're going to build, we're going to insist that if two sets are AS, then they're either both good or both bad. We're also going to insist that if a set is good, then its complement is bad, and vice versa. Now this should give you some pause. You might be worried that we'll have two sets that are AS, but their complements aren't, and we somehow run into a conflict. To show why this isn't a problem, we're going to make use of two pretty nice facts. Fact 1. Suppose that A, B, and C are sets such that A and B are AS, and that B and C are AS. Then it follows that A and C are AS. And it's not too hard to see why. If I only have to make finitely many changes to go from A to B, and then finitely many changes to go from B to C, it's still just finitely many changes to go from A to C. What this means is that we can partition the positive integers into groups where everything in a group is almost the same as everything else in the group, and is essentially different from everything not in the group. To find a set's group, we just have to take all the sets that are almost the same as it. Fact 2. If A and B are AS, then their complements are also AS. Let's look at an example to see why. 
Let's take a to be the set of all prime numbers and b to be the set of all odd prime numbers. Then a's complement is the set of composite numbers and 1, and b's complement is the set of composite numbers and 1, and 2. The only difference between a and b is the number 2, and the same applies to their complements. Okay, imagine I have some set a. With fact 1, we grouped a with all of the sets that are almost the same as a, and we also grouped a's complement with all the sets that are almost the same as its complement. With fact 2, we can see that if I take any set in the group with a and take its complement, it'll be in the group with a's complement. What this lets us do is pair up a's sets. We pair a group with the group consisting of the complements of its members. We're finally ready to set up our determinacy game. For each pair of groups, pick one group to be good and the other group to be bad. I don't care how you pick which group is good and which is bad, just flip a coin if you have to. Note that every time we assign a group to be good, we're actually assigning infinitely many sets to be good because each group of AS sets has infinitely many members. We tell Alice and Bob which sets are good and which sets are bad, and we have them play. Just to remind you, a turn consists of picking a positive integer n and then coloring the next n positive integers. Alice colors them red, Bob colors them blue, and Alice goes first. What I claim is that Alice can't have a winning strategy for this game, but neither can Bob. The proof, much like for Chomp, uses strategy stealing, except this time both players can steal each other's strategies. Let's start by assuming that Bob actually did have a winning strategy for this game. This means that no matter what choices Alice makes, Bob can always respond to force the red set to be a bad set. You can think of this as Bob having an infinite playbook that, whatever Alice does, it tells Bob how to respond. Because we picked the complement of a good set to be a bad set, and the red and blue sets are complements, this means that we could alternatively think of this as Bob trying to force the blue set to be a good set. Well, here's how Alice could win if she had a copy of the playbook. She consults the playbook and sees what it would tell Bob to do if her first move was to just color the number 1. And instead, she colors up to that number. And then for any move that Bob makes, she just pretends that they've changed places where the first player played a 1. And as long as she follows the playbook, the set that she colors red will be the same as the set that Bob would have colored blue if her first move had been to just color 1, except that it'll also have the number 1 in it. And since that's almost the same as Bob's set, it'll be a good set, meaning that Alice could force a win. So Bob can't possibly have a winning strategy or else we get a contradiction, but it turns out that Alice can't have a winning strategy either. Suppose instead that she had a playbook that would tell her how to win, but that Bob was also given a copy of her playbook. And maybe unsurprisingly at this point, he can do something similar. For his first move, he looks at what Alice's response would be if he were to just color one number, and then he colors up to the number that Alice would have colored. And then he pretends that they've swapped places in the world where his first move was to play one. And then he plays what Alice's move would have been. The blue set will be almost the same as what the red set would have been. And since the blue set will now be a good set, the red set is a bad set, meaning that Bob can guarantee that he wins. This means that neither player can have a winning strategy for this determinacy game. So does this mean that the axiom of determinacy, the belief that the determinacy game is determined, is wrong? Well, maybe, but there was one step in the construction of this game that might have left you a bit unsatisfied. In this counterexample, I didn't actually tell you what makes a set good or bad. In each pair of groups, we picked one to be good and bad, but I didn't tell you how to make that choice. And this is because I can't. If you want to make infinitely many choices, you have to use something called the axiom of choice, which says that this is possible. The axiom of choice is one of the standard assumptions of modern mathematics, but it's sometimes described as controversial, and that's because while it tells you that you can make infinitely many choices, it doesn't actually tell you how to make those choices. What this argument actually shows is that the axiom of choice and the axiom of determinacy are incompatible, meaning that you can't assume both at the same time. The axiom of choice can lead to some pretty counterintuitive results. For one example, the Banach-Tarski paradox says that you can take a ball, cut it up into five pieces, move those pieces around a bit, and assemble two copies of the original ball. 
As I said earlier, this seems impossible because rotations and translations don't change something's volume. The trick is to break the ball up into pieces where the concept of volume doesn't apply. We call sets like these non-measurable sets, but it requires the axiom of choice to actually make the construction. If you want to see the details of this paradox, I recommend Vsauce's video on it, which I'll put a link to in the description. If instead of the axiom of choice, you assume the axiom of determinacy, you can prove that every subset of Rn is measurable, which renders the paradox impossible. You might think this is an appealing reason to take the axiom of determinacy over the axiom of choice, but I should note that most mathematicians still prefer to take the axiom of choice. And this is because while you can get some counterintuitive results, it's somehow even stranger if we don't take it. So where does this leave us? Well, it's a bit of a choose-your-own-adventure situation. In the world of math, you can walk down different valid paths depending on which axioms you choose to adopt. And the path you choose can radically alter the landscape of what you can prove. For me, I'll stick with the axiom of choice, because it's honestly more natural to reason with. I'd like to end this video by thanking my good friend Clark Lyons, who's a graduate student like me. He studies logic, and he told me about this argument when I said I was trying to understand the axiom of determinacy. So thanks, Clark. I hope everybody else enjoyed this video. I'll leave some resources to learn more in the description, and if I have to make any corrections, I'll put those in the description too. Please let me know if you have any questions.